Y'all remember episode 31 where we talked about an Iranian study that showed more patients with nosebleeds had the bleeding stop quickly with TXA? And then episode 40, TXA for episexis part Jew? You know, the British NOPAC study that showed no difference in packing with TXA? Well, it's time for TXA for epistaxis part 3, the return of the Iranians. It seems they're back with another paper, so stick around for the details. What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top, located at an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here's your host, Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Welcome back to another episode of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast, where we shine the bright light of science on the darkness of EMS clinical practice. TXA, for some reason, is one of the topics we've covered most here on this podcast. I really have no idea why, and I even once tried to avoid talking more about it. But I just can't. I really don't know why. Maybe maybe it's just that I love talking about papers that reach conflicting results. And if that's the case, this topic of TXA for epistaxis is perfect for me. For those of you who didn't listen to episodes 31 or 40, first off, shame on you. Run along. Go listen to it right now. It's right there in your podcast app. Right there on YouTube. If you didn't, Here's a brief recap. And by the way, this is something I've wanted to say for you know a long time since I've spent too much time on Netflix. Previously on the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. That felt really good. I like that. Anyway, let's go way back to 2013. A guy named Dr. Reza Zahid published an RCT from two emergency departments in Tehran and they randomized adults with atraumatic epistaxis to get either TXA-saturated nasal packing or packing with gauze coated in antibiotic ointment. He found that the TXA group had a bit over twice the rate of bleeding cessation at 10 minutes, and he calculated this as an odds ratio of 228 Now, in episode 31, we discussed the 2018 follow-up study by Dr. Sahid. In this one, they used slightly different methods where they compared TXA-saturated gauze to epinephrine and lidocaine-saturated gauze. They looked at adults specifically who were taking antiplatelet agents like aspirin or Plavix. And in that study, they found similar findings. That is, almost twice as many patients treated with TXA, had bleeding cessation within 10 minutes. Now, both of these Zahed papers were reasonably small. The first one had 216 patients total, so 108 in both groups, and the second had 62 in each group. We wanted a bigger study. Fast forward to episode 40, where we discussed the 2021 NOPAC study. This was done by Rubin and colleagues and published in Annals of Emergency Medicine. This was a multi-center study done in 26 UK emergency departments and enrolled adult patients with epistaxis that was persistent despite direct pressure and insertion of a cotton dental roll saturated with vasoconstrictors for 10 minutes. They took that out, and if there was persistent bleeding, they randomized patients to either a TXA-saturated cotton roll or a sterile water-saturated cotton ball. Their primary outcome was the need for nasal packing after 20 minutes, and ultimately they found no difference between the two groups. Specifically, 41.3% of the placebo group and 43.7% of the TXA group needed packing. That's an odds ratio of 1.11 with a confidence interval 
of 0.77 to 1.59. Now, as a reminder, if the 95% confidence interval crosses one for an odds ratio, the results are not significant. So these results are not significant. In other words, they found no difference. Now, we wanted a larger study, and this was a larger study. They had 242 patients in each group. And as I recall, the general consensus among the academic Twitterati was that this proved TXA didn't work for epistaxis. And as you may remember from that episode, I was a little skeptical, and I'll kind of go into some of those reasons. I also might add, it seems that most of my fellow community emergency physicians and ENT colleagues too, for that matter, kept right on using it. Now that either means that we weren't convinced by the trial or in full disclosure here, maybe we're just literature resistant. Obviously, I don't think that was the case. So that brings us to the current study. So we're gonna go back to Iran and Annals of Emergency Medicine. So the citation for this paper is Husseini al-Hashimi and colleagues. The title is Intranasal Topical Application of Tranexamic Acid in Atraumatic Anterior Epistaxis, a Double-Blind Randomized Control Trial. And again, it was published in Annals of Emergency Medicine this year. So, This is a single center study at an ENT emergency department. I've got to admit, I've never heard of such a thing. In most places in the U.S., we can barely get ENT coverage at all. Okay, I'm spoiled. My hospital, I have great ENT colleagues who actually come in when I need them. And I might add, they were the ones who taught me to use TXA in the first place. So apparently this concept of an ENT ED is a facility run by ENT staff and residents that see only ENT type things. Well, they describe this as a five bed emergency department with 36 inpatient rooms and an OR. And it's a tertiary referral center just for ENT. They're the place other general emergency departments send their epistaxis patients when they can't control the bleeding. I'm assuming they're seeing other ENT stuff too, and you know they're not just a nosebleed ER. I think a lot of my colleagues would like that concept of a nosebleed ER. So what did they do? They enrolled adults with anterior bleeds, and that's important, anterior bleeds who had failed basic procedures like pressure and ice. So they excluded patients with posterior bleeds, those who are hemodynamically unstable, had an allergy to TXA, had bleeding from an ENT malignancy, they had trauma, okay, other than simple nose picking, because as we all know, simple nose picking, no matter what our patients say, is the most common reason for bleeding. So the nose pickers got included in this study. Now they also excluded patients with known bleeding disorders, who were pregnant or prisoners for obvious IRB reasons. And importantly, they excluded patients who were on antiplatelet or anticoagulants. Now they did include patients on aspirin. Now using a blinded process where research nurses would put together these numbered boxes with cotton pledgelets and 10 milliliters of phenylephrine, 50 milligram lidocaine spray, and an unmarked vial that contained either sterile water or 5 milliliters or 500 milligrams of injectable TXA. After patients were enrolled, they were randomized to get one of these two boxes. So the treating physicians, who were all either otolaryngology attendings or residents, they'd open the box up, saturate the cotton ball with the goodies that were in the box, and then pack the nose with it. They would chill for about 15 minutes, come back, remove the packing, and look for persistent bleeding. All right, well, what's persistent bleeding? Well, they defined it, and they defined it as blood visible on the upper lip after wiping. And blood had to be coming from the nose. So if there was persistent bleeding after 15 minutes, they performed electrocauterization in both groups. They zapped the bleed. 
If that failed, then they did anterior packing. So the primary outcome in this study was the proportion of patients in each group that required nasal packing. So as a reminder, this is different than the first two Iranian papers that just looked at time to bleeding cessation. It is, on the other hand, the same as the NOPAC study, so at least we're comparing the same outcomes. So secondary outcomes included emergency department length of stay greater than two hours, the need for electric cautery, rebleeding within 24 hours, and rebleeding between 24 hours and seven days. So they determined in their sample size calculation that they would need to enroll 119 patients in each arm. Well, they ended up getting 120 in each arm. In other words, they met their enrollment goals. The baseline characteristics were similar, as we'd expect in a randomized trial. The median age was either 52 or 53, depending on the group, and 60-ish percent in both groups were male. Now, bottom line results for their primary outcome, they found 50% of TXA patients and 64.2% of placebo patients needed packing. They calculated an odds ratio of 0.56 and a 95% confidence interval of 0.33 to 0.94. Since that didn't include one, this was statistically significant. It translates to 44% decreased odds of the need for packing with TXA compared to placebo. And that's a good thing. For secondary outcomes, they also found fewer patients with TXA had emergency department length of stay over two hours and less had rebleeding at 24 hours. There was no difference in the rates of electric cautery or rebleeding between one and seven days. So, the bottom line is the Iranians are again showing benefit with TXA. So, we're left with another situation, kind of like the one we discussed about ECMO and cardiac arrest, where we had several well-done studies, but conflicting results. Now, in case you missed it, we discussed those conflicting ECMO papers in episode 60. That might have been the one where I suggested Tyler had syphilis. Go back and take a look. That was a good one. I enjoyed that. So how do we deal with conflicting studies? Well, there are different approaches, but here's what I do. I start by determining if we're actually comparing the same interventions in the two trials, and then I look to see how generalizable the populations in each trial are compared to the population of patients that I see. So why don't we do that? So let's start with the Rubin trial. That's the multi-centered UK NOPAC study. Well, it was an emergency-based study. In other words, it was done in general EDs. And the Hassini al-Hashimi paper, that was this specialty referral center where the patients were only seen by ENT docs. Now, neither one of these are EMS-based, but the UK study seems a little closer to the group we see. Also, the Iranian group specifically excluded patients with anticoagulants, while the ED study, the UK one, they had lots of patients, 60 plus percent of patients, in fact, who were on anticoagulants. Now, I'm pretty sure, at least here in my community, that somebody's put Plavix in the water supply. So that seems to me like maybe the UK group might be a little closer to my patients than the Iranian one. The UK group, though, ended up admitting over 40% of their patients. I can't remember the last epistaxis patient I had to admit. That seems like a different group of patients, and I really don't understand why that admit rate was so high. On the other hand, the first two Iranian papers, the ones by Zahid, those were general emergency department patients. And that seems similar to what I see. And as a reminder, they found the results that are similar to this current Iranian paper. In other words, benefit. So my biggest issue, though, is that I don't think these two papers are comparing the same thing. The UK study, 
they only randomized patients after they'd already packed the nose with some type of vasoconstrictor-saturated gauze and held it in place for 10 minutes with a clamp. The Iranian papers, they randomized just after direct pressure had failed. The UK study enrolled all epistaxis, both anterior and posterior, but the current Iranian one, they specifically excluded posterior bleeds. Now granted, most bleeds are anterior, but maybe, just by chance, there were more posterior bleeds in the UK study. That would certainly explain why they didn't see an improvement in TXA and why they had such a high admit rate. That admit rate is really messing with my brain. So what's my bottom line? I have reviewed these four papers plus a systematic review and meta-analysis thrown in for good measure. So what am I going to do? I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. And this is what I and my medics do. We have a patient blow their nose so that we can get exposed to the bleeding source. And then we squirt afrin in the nose, followed by insertion of a TXA-saturated cotton ball. And then we apply direct pressure with a nasal clamp for at least 20 minutes. Now, even though the Iranian study was done in this ENT ED as opposed to a general ED, I think what they were doing is actually closer to what I do than what the British do. And they showed improvement. And that's certainly been my anecdotal experience with both EMS and in my personal practice in the emergency department. I guess the bottom line is TXA is cheap and it's safe. We already have it, both in our ambulances and in my ED for hemorrhagic shock patients. And now I think there is decent evidence to support it. Even the NOPAC trial didn't show harm. They just showed no difference. And they showed that no difference while doing something different than what we do. So as long as there aren't any future papers that you know, show harm, worse outcomes... I'm going to go ahead and side with the Iranians on this one. I think TXA is still the way to go. As always, I would love to hear your comments. Please drop me an email at jeffjarvis at flightbridgeed.com or on Twitter at, at Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Or drop some comments down if you're watching this episode on YouTube. So guys, I'm going to close with this blatant plug. Please, please give us a five-star rating. Seriously, y'all, I mean it. Please, just pull your car over. Just give it a couple clicks on your phone. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't cost you anything. And it really does help us out. All right, so with that bit of crass shillery out of the way, thank you for listening. I hope y'all all have a great day. Take care, y'all. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.